I at any rate react to by saying, gosh, I hadn't really thought of it in quite those terms mm. before. So at a minimum, Brendan, thank you for stimulating our imaginations. Um, there's one aspect, though, of German power that I think we sometimes tend to underplay, and that is this is a unique form of power because it is not a power that is dependent on military capability. And I don't think there has been any other instance of a country um, exercising the role of power that Germany now has in Europe, which has not been dependent on military might. Even the Delian League ultimately um, was subject to the Athenian navy. And because we've never had a, a, a power of this kind before, it's not easy to know what to make of it. Should it be a source of concern or not? I mean, there's only a German problem if people think Germany is a problem. So do they? Uh, let, let's reflect a little on, on the reasons for German power. In the first instance, and most important one, to use the Bill Clinton phrase, it's the economy, stupid. I mean, Germany not, has not only the biggest, but the best performing economy in Europe, and also an economic and social model, the Sojana Marktwirtschaft, um, which is widely admired. That's a fact of an objective fact of life, which is going to be the case whatever governance arrangements are established. The, the, the second factor is the willingness of others to accept German leadership. Germany, as you rightly said, has not, modern Germany has not set out to lead. It's others who have chosen to follow. Others agreed to the rules for the euro. Uh, you mentioned Theo Weigel. I remember the press conference he gave when he was asked when the euro was set up, but what would happen if a country doesn't follow these rules, doesn't apply these criteria? And he rather blithely said, of course they will. It would be shameful for a, foreign, a finance minister to come to a meeting like this and have to admit that his country um, was uh, not up to scratch. Well, um, the good Teo obviously under, underestimated the capacity for shame of his, of his successors. Um, he was the first to do <laughs> And, and, and indeed, Germany itself didn't live up to the rules. Um, but it's, the, it's, it's the, the fact that others admire this model and um, want to emulate it. The, th the third reason, which is often not given too much prominence, is um, the institutions of the European Union are cast in a German model. I mean, the Commission is the Bundesregierung, the Parliament is the Bundestag, uh, the Council of Ministers is the Bundesrat. Um, the, the, the whole culture of these institutions is, is, is German. Free trade, uh, the importance of competition, um, the role for the social partners. Uh, I, I worked in the Commission in the 80s. We had to operate in French, but we had to think in German. That was the reality of it then. The same is true now, except that it's English rather than French. And, of course, many of the people involved in these institutions are also German. I mean, the, the, the president of the commission may be Luxembourger, but that's probably as near to German as you can get. Mm -hmm. um, his chief of staff is a German. There are more German heads of cabinet than any other nationality, more German directors general. The, the president of the European Parliament is a German. The chairman of the biggest parliamentary group is German. Um, the Germany has more committee chairs and rapporteurs than anybody else. So it, it is a German, it is a German Europe in that sense. Uh, my the, the question I would put to Brendan and to my colleagues is: Is this really such a bad thing? Uh, is it a, a, a threat, a problem, or is it just you know an actual fact of life? And if you want to establish the political union that um, even German politicians say they want, when will somebody, either a German or indeed anybody else, but particularly a German, say, how will it look, this political union? What powers will it have? 
that I think is what's lacking at the moment. Christophe? Can I yeah. add something? I mean, you describe the uniqueness of the German power in a way which is not historical. Forgive me if I'm saying this, because you're describing the German power as it stands today. Right. Um, it has been prepared, uh, prepared, of course, by, by uh, military power. It was the Prussians who prepared the, the ground, so to speak, for the present state. And that nowadays, being the economic powerful means to be the dominating um, nation in a group of, of others is the result of the European um, Economic Union. That, uh, I mean, and that is what we shouldn't forget in this context. And therefore, I really endorse, I, I admire you, first of all, for your book, and secondly, for the presentation, and thirdly, for what I only learned now, for your intentions. Um, I mean, that is unique when you're looking back to the uh, last 600 or uh, even 1,000 years of history. It is a history in which the, the military argument always was present. So it was always a tool by which you could defeat the other, you just wage war against it. And this has disappeared for the last 70 years. I mean, and that is enormously. Uh, first of all, I, I, I really found it fascinating, the big picture you painted, uh, uh, Professor Sims. Um, I would like to pick up two words uh, which were just uttered here. One is the German leadership, and the other thing is the civilian dominance or a preponderance uh, of European power. When we talk about leadership, I think history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And one has to keep in mind the collective psychology and experience of a people. So after the Second World War, it was quite obvious there was absolutely no appetite left in Germany to be a leader. There was even less appetite to be militarily uh, rearmed. So, and the price was that people expected us to do what normal countries do, namely also to send our boys the harm's way and to come up with the hard power. And it took us quite some time to get used to this. And we are still not quite there yet because we constantly re-emphasize soft power civilian power, which in many cases is right. But here is something, Paul, I would say, if the global circumstances change, I don't think the European Union, and Germany in particular, will get away in the future with this emphasis on economy and soft power. I mean, we have seen in the uh, uh, reaction to Putin's behavior on the Crimea and in the Donetsk, um, the only thing we could agree upon with some uh, persuasion were the sanctions. Now, the sanctions apparently don't do the whole job. What if, is, if Putin is encouraged by the lack of military uh, response to get further? And so people, and, and you, I think, also worked uh, on NATO a lot, people started remembering the good old Armel doctrine. We said in many crises, what has proven successful for the alliance was that on the one hand, you have to make absolutely clear that you are able and ready to defend your interests and your values. On the other hand, you should always have the hand outstretched, have the door open to re-engage. And I think in the good years, when some of us believed it was the end of history, there was only this unipolar moment, we did not concentrate enough on the first part of Amel. And this is, I think, what Europe has to do now. And it's very, very tough, and I say this here uh, uh, with a guilty conscience, Germany is extremely bad in that, as we have seen in the, in the recent NATO uh, um, um, summits. Uh, this is one thing I would, I, would, I would like to mention. The other thing is, I liked your prescriptions for the future. We need the Big Bang, piecemeal, or as the Chancellor says, driving on site doesn't work. Now, how are you going to do this? <laughs> How are you going to do this? Because I don't see any people in Europe who has great appetite for the Big Bang, especially after the failure of the referenda on the convention. And this is where I feel that leadership comes in. 
I asked Schäuble some time ago, why don't you do this and this, said people wouldn't stand for it. And then I reminded him of a uh, funny anecdote about Adenauer when we had uh, the start of the rearmament debate. Globke came to him and said, Mr. Chancellor, we can't do that. Public opinion is against it. And Adenauer was supposed to have answered, und was tun Sie jetzt, Herr Globke? What are you going to do about it, Mr. Globke? <laughs> and I think, uh, and now, now seriously again, I think this is exactly the time when we have this to start domestically and internationally a new big debate because the status quo doesn't do it. Of course you can say you cannot repair the ship while it's the high sea, but you have to repair it sometime and now is the time to do it and unfortunately only politicians who not have been re-elected, who just retired, prescribe that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Sometimes in German political discourse there is a feeling that it would all be so much easier if we did it at the European level. Um, I mean, I, I agree with what you say. I think there is a need for German leadership now to persuade people that Germany has to be more active, take more responsibility, including military responsibility. And to be fair, the, the, the president in his speech at the Munich Security Conference two years ago, three, two years ago has yeah. started mm -hmm. that process. But these were essentially arguments for Germany seeing its national interest and its national responsibility in a more ambitious way. Would it really be any easier at the European level? Because here you come across, you come up against the problem that, uh, Dr. Flick, in your introduction, you, you listed the, the values that we have in Europe, human rights, democracy, rule of law, and you ended, I think, with the sovereignty of the people. Yes, but what people? Unless there is a European demos, sovereignty, a European people, a European electorate, sovereignty can't be exercised. I mean, pedantically in Britain, it's not the people technically who are sovereign, it's the crown in parliament, but the principle is the same. The, the difficulty we have with Europe is that we don't see ourselves as sufficiently European. Do the Germans, do many other countries in Europe? I, I, I remember in, in the, um, I think it's the, the present government program, uh, or if not in one of the party manifestos, uh, the idea of a European army subject to parliamentary control was endorsed. But that left open whose parliament will do the controlling. And I'm afraid what it comes down to is, would the German electorate, or for that matter the German constitutional court, be happy for German soldiers to be sent off to war on the basis of a majority decision in the Council of Ministers against which the German representative had voted through the endorsement of the European Parliament in which no German MP had had. Uh, supported the idea. I just don't no. see it. You, you could say, well, that's a caricature. It would no, never no, no, happen. No, it's not we, a, no, it's we make now shorter that yeah, right. yeah. statement. Yeah. No, 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 it's, it's, it's not a caricature. I think it could be done in a similar way as the German Bundestag mandates mission under the uh, peacekeeping mandates of, of the UN. I don't see any difficulty. I mean, for instance, let's assume if something terrible happens in the Ukraine. I could very well see that a number of parliaments really mandate their military to go into a joint action. And yep. this is purely and, and, and perfect democratic. I think as far as the, the, sorry, as the constitutional court is concerned, um, there is a sense in the German constitution that it is provisional until the establishment of a pan-European solution. Um, so I think that so long as that had been decided by the German people, and indeed by the other uh, peoples of Europe, um, I think that would be constitutionally perfectly defensible. The, the problem with the, with the sovereignty argument is the United Kingdom is a special case because it A is not part of the, the Euro and B is, it's, if you like, it, it has the Goldilocks quality of statehood. It's just large enough. Um, it's just right and it's not too big in a sense, like Germany. Um, but all the peoples who have joined the Eurozone, they have already given up their sovereignty. 
And this, this is my argument. So but do they, well, rea they realise it? Have they consciously decided to do it? I, I assume so. Mm. Um, now my question to you would be, mm. in sight of all these difficulties, which were nicely uh, described mm. by both of you, um, what, what do you think is a feasible step? What would be the next feasible step? Whom would you have to convince in, about your idea? Well, with the short, shortcut is a constitutional convention in which you simply lay down the fact that you cannot have a common currency without a political union and that they're for all the reasons I've given. Who's taking leadership? Well, that, that has to be, that has to be intergovernmental, but the, the ultimate decision over uh, the constitution and the system, which, I, as I say, has to be some sort of variation of the Anglo-American constitution, yeah, but, uh, 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 political union, that would have to be put to a referendum in each, in each country. At some stage, you would have to do that, but mm -hmm. we all have lived through the experience of the last convention. Mm -hmm. So this thing will sink without a trace in certain referenda if it's not prepared by a very thorough discourse in our countries mm -hmm. with trade unions, with the NGOs, civil society, have you not, in order to run that risk again, because it mm -hmm. failed already once. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let's come back a little bit to the role of Germany, mm -hmm. because we wanted to talk about power and powerlessness mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Germany today. Um, because these are more general questions, no, if for Italy, for France, if we are happy to join in mm -hmm. to one. So has Germany really a role to lead as a power or not? I, I would say, uh, I mean, I hate as a German, I hate the word leadership because in German it's Führerschaft. Okay. So I would, no, 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 it's important. So I would rather talk of, about responsibility. Responsibility is something totally different and we owe it to our history, to our geography, to our economic weight and power that we live up to that responsibility. And that means try to restart the German-French, perhaps the German-French-British engine and keep all the small ones on board. The interesting thing about German leadership in the old days was that when Germany and France got together, they really could do the heavy lifting without any complaints from the small ones. Only if the two big ones didn't do the job, then the small ones complained. And this is now unfortunately a situation. You have France sinking, Britain halfway out of the door, and Germany pretty much left alone. Here comes a negative possible outlook. Um, I'm extremely concerned about the VW scandal. Um, the German economy is dependent to a third on the, on the car manufacturing. And if that collapses, we've got a huge problem. And then the German problem is again the European problem. There is one thing you cannot accuse Germany of, and that is not showing leadership. No. Quite the contrary. The EU's policy was led by Germany. It was bound to be led by Germany because of the sheer economic predominance that Germany has. A country of that size and with that success cannot just sit and wait for others to suggest what ought to be done, nor can it, I think, really say it's for the Commission to propose and we won't give any indication of what we think and, until they do. Um, you can argue about whether the leadership which Germany um, exerted was wise. No, it was you, not you, wise. You, you can say, was it, was it really wise to insist on the fulfillment of the Maastricht criteria? Shouldn't there have been some easing? Shouldn't there have been more borrowing? All, all these are perfectly fair questions. But Germany undoubtedly exercised leadership. And it exercised leadership in demanding the application of the rules that everyone had agreed. There was nothing quixotic about Germany's policies. They weren't invented just to deal with Greece. They were the ones that everybody signed up to from Maastricht onwards. All Germany asked was that the rules should be obeyed. And nobody was, as you said, nobody was forced to obey them. Greece could have left the euro if it wanted to. Whether these rules will change in the future is, of course, the open question. But one of the leitmotifs of German policy over the years, has it not, has been the EU is not and must never become a transfer union. Do we really see that changing? Well, it, it, it already is a transfer union. It Up already is a transfer union, but it is a transfer union without rules. 
uh, today I read an Mnet uh, poll that over 60% of the Germans are for a transfer union, but a transfer union with rules. Exactly. It's leadership in a confederal context. And so the, the, the crisis requires federal instruments to solve, and we are applying confederal yeah. uh, uh, measures. So it's a little bit like asking, you know, should uh, a crisis in the United States be led by Virginia or by mm -hmm. California yeah. or whatever? What we're trying to do is to, is, is to solve problems as if, you know, the United States were a confederation of 50 or so state governors. Try then to, 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 to uh, 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 reinvigorate the economy. Try then to address the problem of, of illegal migrants. And particularly if the most powerful state were an enormous great big state right at the heart of the United States, it would then say, we're not worried about what happens in Mexico or the Caribbean or, or not to the same extent. It would create a, a bizarre dynamic. So we've designed a very strange uh, system in Europe with this enormous great power at the heart of it. And that's, it's not the fault of the Germans as such, but it's not a problem that can be solved through German leadership. You can only have the individual leadership of intergovernmentally, of which the Germans would be the most important, to bring us to a point after which there would then have to be federal politics. There would then no longer be a Germany or a France or in Italy in the same way as sovereign states. That, that's my argument. Yeah, well, uh, uh, we speak of leadership of countries, but I think to be a leader, you need to be a person. Countries are run by persons. And uh, to be quite frank, I think, maybe that's because in hindsight, I think what we're lacking is leaders of the stature, I don't know, uh, uh, name names now, we've seen in the past. Um, for instance, the personal chemistry between the German Chancellor and the French President is of utmost importance. And if you don't do enough on your side to re-establish that chem chemistry, then you're not a leader. If you say, um, I watch the problems as they are, I keep my options open, I drive on site, and at the last possible moment, I do only as much as it is necessary to solve this particular crisis, then it's not the sort of leadership which Europe needs. Can I add to this, just in order to endorse it, that is what I've learned even in 2,000 years of history back in, in ancient Roman times. It always goes down to a person. There is always a person behind it. So that was actually in the back of my mind when I was asking you, how do you want or how do you imagine to get the next step um, being done? You need a person, you need an individual who is convinced of your idea and who is now forcing through or trying to impose on the others, we do now this kind of electorate, constitutional electorate. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you have in, do you have particular persons in mind? Do you well, see anyone? I, I did try as on Herr Schäuble, um, because he launched the German edition of my book in Berlin. Um, he was very polite. <laughs> okay, okay. He, it's, it's fair to say I, did, I didn't persuade him. Um, I think there's only two other, if it's not done the way you've described, which I think is, is, is the preferable method, there's only two other methods. One is through a bottom-up political movement. That's really what the Project for Democratic Union is all about. Or alternatively, which I'm tending towards, is the idea of some kind of Anglo-American interest in this, and particularly the Americans who I think have shown a real lack of leadership in Europe because they, in a sense, have a stake and they have a, a right to express a view on how Europe should be ordered. It is, after all, the world created by the Anglo-Americans we live in. You, you know, maybe these days also the problems, the universal problems unify. And maybe Europe at one day must, because we face Italy, France, Germany, we all face the same problems. So maybe we have to work together and it just needs a little bit of new thinking. This fits nicely into what I just wanted to say. Um, I was extremely surprised to learn only in this summer, uh, when I was on a seminar with Hans Werner Sinn in, 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 in Munich, that the Greek crisis, as a matter of fact, is not so much an economic crisis. The reason why we have this intense debate is a geopolitical one. And I felt reminded when I was reading your book, because this is the um, reappearance of uh, the Ottoman Empire, which is coming now in the, in the shape of the Muslimic world. 
and an Islamic world, and where we have now the confrontation. Turkey is not any longer the secure southwest, southeastern part, mm -hmm. and therefore we have to protect uh, uh, Greece. All of a sudden, it's the interest of uh, Obama that Germany forgives the, the debts of, 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 of Greece. I mean, that is in economic terms a nonsense. In geopolitical terms, it's a real big issue, and that might be a power which is now, again, coming from the southeast that hopefully. Thank you very much, Brennan Sims. Thank you very much, my panel. Thank you very much, your wonderful audience. <laughs>